Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. So, Emily, we're in the middle of December here. Have you had any uh, opportunity to go to holiday parties? No, but I do have my annual holiday party with my friends here in San Francisco on Saturday. And so it will start actually with a wine event and then end at karaoke. Whoa, really? That sounds like a pretty good one, like a moving holiday party. Yeah. I have I've not done one of those. A progressive start <laughs> here, you go there. Yeah, it's cool. There's this really cool place called the St. Joseph's Arts Foundation or Society here that's a Ken Falk space and they do like a lot of events and so they're doing a holiday wine tasting event with a bunch of local wineries like scribe and everything it'll be really cool that's the start and then we have a group that's a pretty committed karaoke crew as you know that's a theme in my life and uh we go to this place called do re mi <laughs> hmm. which is cute and it's actually byo which oh is that is really cool do yeah. you uh do you sing holiday karaoke or is it just traditional karaoke it's the tradish, yeah. but I'm sure we do have a ambitious singer in the crew. So I'm sure someone will do the Mariah Carey <laughs> all I want for Christmas. <laughs> She's got a set of pipes. So, you know, wow. I, I condone it. Yeah. What about you? Um, yeah, I went to one, uh, this weekend, had one the weekend before, uh, seems just to be that, that time of year. It's kind of nice that it's back, you know, after all the, yeah. the kind of COVID slowdown, I think there were some last year, but just seems to be like fully ramped, but I, I bring it up because you know, we wanted to bring, you know, something to the party and, you know, so we, we had a bottle of wine and, you know, I was like, well, this is fun, but like, maybe we should bring some weed, you know, just as kind of something more interesting. And um, so I went to the store on the way and kind of looked around for something that was good for maybe a, a you know, a group that doesn't consume often, you know, certainly doesn't smoke. So, you know, flour and pre-rolls would, would be a, a, you know, probably wasted. Um, so I kind of went to the edibles and beverage section and looked around and, and really there weren't that many options. So I ended up with a kind of a low dose, um, like a five milligram gummy. Mm -hmm. uh, they did have one like kind of holiday peppermint bark type product, but those were 10 milligrams per serving. And I'm just a little, I know that's like the standard serving size, but I'm really not sure how much they consume. And so I don't want to have them overdo it and to have to like give all these explanations of, Oh, you should maybe cut this in half or something to start it's just yeah. like too much overhead. No one wants to do it. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, 10 milligrams to a lot of people is nothing. 10 milligrams to a lot of people is a lot. And so I like to, to start with the five, but it really got me thinking about holiday products in general, you know, outside of, you know, I'm in Seattle and so yeah. looking at the Seattle products, but you know, what else is out there? And there's actually a, a fair amount uh, that we see in the headset data that come up at this time of year in, in the sales numbers. And it's that kind of made me happy because I was a little <laughs> bummed out that there wasn't more selection this year. And, and I remember in years past, uh, early days of, of the legal market, there was much more of it, but it seems to have pulled back a little bit. But some some that I saw in the list, and you you may know even more, but uh, I saw sugar cookies uh, from brands like Dr. Norm's, uh, Big Pete's. Uh, those are California brands, I believe. Um, there was, uh, this one looked really cool. The Camino gummies, they'd have like a holiday punch. Um, and I actually pulled the data on that. And for the month of December so far, I mean, we're, you know, barely two weeks into it here. Uh, it's 5% of Kiva sales are going to these holiday gummies right now. So they're doing well. Um, you know, they're in like the top 15 products uh, that they have. So uh, anyways, I thought it was cool. And I just wanted to kind of t touch on that because, uh, you know, I think it's a neat and kind of mirrors a lot of what you see in, in traditional C CPG, right? Like, you, you know, at the grocery store, you'll see end caps for like, um, what, like winter ale, you know, beer, you know yeah. what I mean? That's, that's everywhere. And, and yeah. you just, you know, don't see that much of it in our industry yet. No, I mean, I think this is a sign like you and I discuss frequently that this is a consumer products category. And so this is a maturation of an industry where you do plan many quarters in advance, by the way, to have a holiday offering and holiday offerings. And to your point, in other consumer categories come in the form of flavors. 
but all in packaging, of course, but also in kind of merchandising together. So there's there's ways you can do kind of gifting packs or things like that, which, as you actually pointed out when we were prepping, can be more difficult in our industry because of the labeling and and all of the uh, trace and track and trace that we have to go through in our industry. But still, I think it's really exciting. I did see um, the Kiva step on that, and Kiva has been a leader on this. They've always been one of the first to go in the form of having an offering around the holiday and they also as you know I think they had the gravy packets which oh, I thought they do really have gravy good. packets yeah. I saw that too yeah yeah so I I like this I think it's a fun way to create a a hostess gift as we call it in a more traditional world of something you bring to a party or bring to a, the house of someone who's hosting you for it a meal and uh and yeah I, yeah so i'm really i'm excited by it and i like seeing that our industry continues to push forward on this consumer product trajectory to offering these different things so yeah cool. i'm sure yeah it is cool and i'm sure it takes a lot of work and a lot of planning and yeah without the the marketing it's it's pretty tough you got to get that shelf space too and and yeah. you know retailers have to make room for it but i i think it's a neat trend and i think it you know carries with that theme of normalization uh, you know, when you're able to bring it to to a party like that, and even if they're not a consumer, at least it's now in their house and they can choose versus, you know, the non-consumers that will not go out of their way to go to a retailer and, you know, shop, right? It's it's yeah. getting people into the category can be tough. So this is like a good way to do it. And it's, it's still kind of fun and kind of unique. And uh, when we got to this party, uh, you know, it was in a wine bag with wine. Um, and there are these uh, gummies of Pioneer Squares here um, from from Craft Elixirs, just really good stuff. And he put it in like the side and kind of was like, oh, this is the good bag, you know, and like kind of even though there was already like 10 bags of wine, like everyone brought a bottle of wine. Right. <laughs> the, you know, and we yeah. did, too, to be fair. But with the gummies, it kind of, I think, made a bit better of an impression. So uh, I don't know. I want to see more of it that you were talking about the the scanning and the challenges with um, traceability. That was uh, early on when the, there was a retailer here in, in the Seattle area that did an advent calendar. And it was a kind of a special um, thing that they did where, you know, you got 23, 24 days worth of product and uh, every day you'd open it and there'd be something new. And it would be everything from, you know, a gram of flour to like a lighter or, or wrapping, right. uh, rolling paper. So wrapping paper, <laughs> um, maybe that's the, another idea, right? Holiday rolling papers. Um, anyways, <laughs> uh, it was really cool, but they, the checkout, they, I remember talking to the, the people at the store and they hated it. They hated it because it took so much work to prep and like, um, get everything set up and then everything had to be labeled individually and everything had to be scanned individually. So you got this receipt with like, 25 items on it, you know, not just like the one like advent calendar. Uh, but it was fun. You know, we brought it over to the office and we kind of had a, a, you know, everyone had, we just kind of rotated uh, who got to open it that day and got to take home whatever was in there. Um, but I'd love to see more of that, I think. Yeah. And I think it's, it's interesting the way you positioned it too, is like the more kind of curious category of consumers who are not necessarily the ones going for flour or the pre-roll. Um, but yeah, there is, there's also the idea of doing gift cards. And I think that's a really good idea. Cause I know my friends, for example, are very interested and we'll be talking about this shortly as the beverage category. Um, but they don't, you know, they don't know how to think about it. But one of the thoughts I had is this company called Birchmount. They do have gift cards and it seems like a perfect kind of gift for someone who is like, I want to try one of the sessions exact specifically one of the sessions beverages, but I don't know, you know, what the deal is. And so if you get them a gift card, it kind of gives them the impetus to get into the store and to try it out. And so I think it's a good one for brands and products to think about and actually retailers too, to reach a new audience and so that they have kind of a designated spend to give it a shot. And you can even think about gifting them the amount of what it would cost to get like a four pack or something like that. Um, so just another take on gifting in our industry and, and a way that makes it more approachable for people who are newer to the category. Yeah, I think um, I think that's really cool. You're you're absolutely right. Like if you have that gift card, it's kind of like a a pass, like a permission slip. Like you're okay to go here because you have this, and you kind of have to use it, right? So mm -hmm. um, versus you know people that are outside of the category and are curious about it, but just don't get the um, the energy to go in. So having that gift card is is pretty cool. 
So I've, I've, you know, haven't seen that yet uh, around here, but we'll definitely, I'll definitely look out because that's a cool gift uh, for sure for people. But um, on the holiday theme, uh, there was a, a can beverages mm-hmm. uh, kind of what, what, what would you call it? It's like commercial, but like a short film, but it was, yeah. I mean, short, short film, like three, five minutes, right? But longer than a commercial, but, but a commercial, but all mm-hmm. holiday themed. Uh, mm-hmm. What was, what was going on with that? Yeah. I feel like it was kind of a, yeah, it was an artistic taste take on an ad because it was kind of stating the case for why beverage should have a place or cannabis beverage should have a place at the holiday table. And, um, I thought it, I thought it was interesting. It's beautifully shot. It's very artistic and it had, it was very inclusive, which I know is very on brand for can. Um, but it was interesting because they also did a partnership with Jane, which is a delivery, essentially a delivery pr- platform or order ahead platform. And so they could, or, you know, should they actually kind of talk to you through how you could order it from uh, one of your local resources using Jane. So, or, or finding it through Jane. So I thought it was a interesting kind of infomercial is not the right thing either, but it was just kind of like a, it was an art piece in a way. And so, you know, um, this is the kind of thing that I do think just on a sidebar, you know, when you're looking at the bigger consumer product categories, they do invest in these kind of statement marketing pieces as a way to help engage consumers and to inform them and to bring them along. And our industry does not have a ton of capital around it. And so we don't have the opportunity to do these kind of intense brand building or category building uh, things. So I thought it was great that Can took the step to do this. And, um, you know, they are carrying the water kind of for the beverage space by taking that step because they're educating consumers that this is a possibility. Um, and then other beverages could probably kind of take a little lift on that. So um, I think in general, I mean, you know how I feel. We need a Got Milk campaign for the industry, but... Um, We'll see where we get, but yeah, it was it was cool and it was definitely very holiday centric and and we do know people have very mixed feelings around the holidays where it can be a real pain point for people as they're getting together with um, family or friends who maybe they've got some like narcissistic wounds <laughs> with, mm-hmm. and also can be wonderful like to the point of what we were both talking about of like bringing bringing gifts or um, sharing what we like about cannabis with our friends and family. So uh, I thought it was cool and. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to at some point see more of these kind of creative marketing endeavors for the industry. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think it does that. Uh, it does work towards that normalization, um, mm-hmm. gets a lot of good press and you know, let, lets people uh, gives them insight into what is out there, uh, that they might not be aware of. Like we're so close to it that uh, it's hard to kind of have that frame of reference. And, and I'm sure it's, you know, connecting with people that aren't and, uh, to be able to see, Oh, this is, something that exists and I wasn't aware given how challenging marketing is in this space, you know, you're not just going to see a billboard. Well, you know, maybe you'll see a bill, but you won't see a commercial certainly. Um, so really, uh, really tough. So these types of things I think help and help with the normalization. I remember back at Leafly, we did this ad in the New York times and it was like the, a full page ad in the New York times with, um, with like, uh, photo of a guy walking in New York and thinking about cannabis and had like a tile, strain tile, and it was just an ad for Leafly. And, and really what that did, I mean, I'm sure it drew some people to Leafly, but it really opened a lot of eyes, uh, on like, Oh, cannabis is, is a thing that's, you know, more normalized, um, Mm -hmm. you know, for, for a broader audience. Um, and so I, I think they can be pretty powerful and they certainly generate a lot of like, um, uh, what is the term? It's like a, kind of derivative like media like a lot of blog posts or articles you know in mm-hmm. in in the press about it so i think it, it pays for itself just there right with you know getting picked up by uh, search engines and so on so uh, you know good on them for doing it and and good to kind of keep pushing it forward um and yeah i mean it's uh the drink market you know i think and can use those kinds of uh boosts you know given it's still such a small percentage but hopefully, uh, continue to grow. But I also do want to talk about the drink market and not related to holidays, but just drinks in general, because, uh, this was a a pretty big headline with, uh, Canada, Canada being so locked down on drinks, right? 10 milligram maximum in a beverage. 
-hmm. And I think you could get five beverages because it had to do with weight. And um, I don't know, when they did the rules, I don't think anybody really thought about actually how restricting it was going to be. And at the same time, Canada like was fueled by beverage companies like Constellation, um, you know, Molson and all sorts that came in very excited about this like new category that is, um, you know, adjacent to their category in some ways. Uh, and uh, it just hasn't really been particularly successful for Canada or nor, nor in the U S as far as percentage of market. But I think the limitations, you know, artificially, um, you know, kept that, uh, in a, in a tough spot. So the, the big news, what I want to talk about is that Canada finally increased their cannabis drink purchase limit to 48 cans, which is from five to 48. That's a lot. And that's a lot of cans for sure. But you know, if back to our holiday party, you know, you're hosting, you can go in and, and buy 48 cans, uh, you know, for, for your big party versus buying five, you know, and then having, you know, 10 milligrams per can and kind of having to, you can't really share that much of that and not, not great. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty big news. Um, you know, with, with respect to the, the amount of cans, but it's like four, four 12 packs and yeah, got me thinking a bit about <laughs> strange brew, yes. which, uh, I haven't seen in, in probably decades, yes. but, uh, if you remember Bob and Doug McKenzie and they would sit in front of all these stacks of 12ers. Um, so that's, I, th I think now that, uh, I don't know now that you can, I, you know, I don't know if anybody's doing it yet, but you know, making 12 verse, but you can have a bunch of 12 verse of, of cannabis drinks and you can have a whole new reboot of, of Bob and Doug. I think that would be awesome. I don't know. I was just going to say they love their 12 packs and they love their 24 packs. And it's like, get your Molson Canadian, get your Labatt Blue. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, but instead, I, I know Rick Moranis, man, it's so good. So I mean, good. anyone who hasn't seen Strange Brew, definitely check it out. It's a Canadian delight. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it was a, um, a spinoff of uh, SCTV, right? Or it was a, it was a skit on SCTV, I think, originally. And then they made the movie. I think that's how, how it worked. Um, yeah. but yeah, a bunch of hosers, a bunch of hosers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, stuff. but it is good. But in, in, so to look at a little bit of data, right. Uh, beverages are more popular in Canada than in the U S. So even though they're 10 milligram limit and in the U S you know, you can have beverages like the top selling beverage in, in California is hundred milligram uncle Arnie's cause it's hundred milligrams. It's, it's cost effective at, you know, I think less than $10, uh, pre-tax Canada. It's, it's capped at 10 milligrams, uh, but still, uh, is, is 2.1% of total sales in Canada versus 1.1 of total sales in the U S. Um, you know, we see seasonality data, uh, again, holidays, right? So I think more people are buying drinks. This is something we've covered when we talk about things like Thanksgiving, uh, but that's certainly reflected in, in the data. Um, a lot of brands uh, in the Canadian market. And I think that goes back to, you know, a lot of these JVs and actually the top selling drink in Canada uh, across the provinces we track um, is XMG, which is a trust uh, beverage, which is in partnership with Molson. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing a lot of, you know, that kind of world come in, um, all sorts of brands popping up. And then I want to kind of discuss this, like the average beverage price in Canada right now, uh, seven bucks, uh, seven dollars and one cent. And that's pre-tax post discount, as I would say, from the headset data. Uh, and that's for a 10 milligram drink. And that's, you know, 84 bucks uh, for a 12 pack. And that's pre, uh, again, pre-tax. So, you know, it, it's getting up there. Uh, I'm not sure the tax rate uh, in Canada on this stuff, but, you know, in, in markets like Washington, I mean, we, you know, you're paying like almost 30% out the door after you have the uh, the liquor uh, tax and you have this the sales tax and so on. Not that it's that expensive in Canada, but still that's up there. So I'm like, you know, this is great. So I feel like, okay, well, here we are. We're going from five cans, which you can't even get a six pack of something. You can get a five pack, which when have you ever seen a five pack, except for when someone's like stolen one uh, <laughs> at, at a store or something. But, uh, you, you know, a, 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 now you can get a six pack or a 12 pack, but it's still pretty expensive. And I feel like it needs, the cost needs to come down a little bit. Um, on like a per drink basis for this thing to really hit, but it seems like it's getting there at this point. Yeah, I think it is getting there. And I think it's good for Canada that they've, they've started to open this up and, 
you know, I don't know, maybe there's something to keeping it at 10 milligrams a can because 100 milligrams a can is is a lot. And we know that. Yeah, it's driving the market here. And um, I don't know, since I think it is a category that attracts the more can of curious, as we've been talking about, I do sometimes wonder if they stumble into a 100 milligram (laughs) beverage, they didn't realize what they're doing. Um, You know, that's not ideal. I mean, that's kind of one of the first ways I had too much cannabis was with a Dixie Elixir product in oh, sure. uh, yeah. Colorado back in like 2014. I think I took like a capful and I was like, oh, damn. But, yeah. um, you know, things have come a long way since then, of course, and good for them for being pioneers. But uh, I do think that it's a little bit interesting in Canada. They've got this and it kind of forces the playing field to be leveled out at the 10 milligram per beverage. And so you've got to figure out how to get your costs contained and and create some margin around this product and distribute it intelligently. So whereas in California, you know, a lot of these companies were very brave and bold and knew they had to lead the market in terms of these two and a half to five milligram beverages, but the market's still living at that hundred milligram level where it's mil- the calculus is milligram per dollar. So, right. um, you know, it's, it's good that they're able to serve that customer, but I think, you know, I'm hoping we continue to see the trend to the, to the beverages that, you know, people like me like to consume and that I think more people will want to try as we reach more consumers. So, I'm I'm glad Canada did open this up though because being able to get you know 48 and in Canada I can tell you I mean I grew, I grew up right across the Niagara River from Canada and and grabbing 48 beverages 48 units of a beverage is not an unforeseen you know it happens kind of Load regularly up the trunk yeah 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 exactly the not that we're encouraging that but uh, you certainly it certainly happens all the time yeah go for it. Live Go your best for life. It. Yeah, <laughs> right? now you get forty eight of them. I love it. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. The the ten milligram, it's kind of a nice entry point, uh, ten or less too. And and you know people yeah. can work their way into the hundreds, but the hundreds aren't going to bring uh, new consumers to the category. I think mm-hmm. it will do the opposite. Mm-hmm. So you know having having ten or less and being able to buy a six pack or a twelve pack is huge. And then getting to that scale because I, I think the pricing is 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 a tough part. And I was looking up some numbers like what, where is the cost? Because if, if in California you can get a hundred milligrams of THC and an uncle Arnie's for less than 10 bucks, uh, you know, these 10 milligrams, it's not necessarily in the milligrams of THC, but it sounds like it's more in the production. Um, and I think it's the, the lack of scale. Cause when you have like Molson Coors, you're like, well, they know how to do it, but it's because they've got these massive, factories probably spread all over Canada. They're just cranking them out. And in, when it comes to cannabis, it's, it's certainly not at that kind of scale. Right. So maybe until we see that, but I would love it like five bucks a can, like a craft brew. I feel like it needs to, needs to get there. Maybe four bucks. It's like seven's just still a little steep for that, that 12 pack, but maybe you get the cannabis premium and, and all of that. But, um, I don't know. It'd be nice if it was a little cheaper. It would. It's a little steep, um, but I do think you're right. It's subscale, and we have seen, and we use our headset data to track inventory levels. Like you don't want inventory building on these. You want to be able to sell them through. And then I do think one thing I meant to mention is that I think the cans that they have to use does have a special coating so that it doesn't um, eat away the oh, THC. Yeah. So you have to. It may be a different. And they're cost. childproof, right? That's another and piece. The ch- right. I break a nail. <laughs> every time I open a cannabis beverage, which is not ideal. Um, but you know, I, I figured out, I mean, obviously I've, I got smart after the first time I did it. I'm exaggerating. I use a knife, but I don't think that's the point. I don't think I should have to use a knife. You use to a knife to poke on the end of it so you can shotgun it. Right. That's where the Sh- knife comes. <laughs> yeah. I stab two ends and then I turn it into an actual smoking device when I'm on the <laughs> that too. Right? <laughs> That's for the real ones. Okay, gang. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, um, Well, it's still cool and uh, it's progress and it it feels like, you know, it's easy to write rules. It's, it's hard to change the rules as we've seen in in so Mm. many places. So it's Mm -hmm. neat that they're, they're doing this. Uh, Hopefully we start to see that reflected in the data. Maybe it goes from 2% to maybe a nice 3% of the market, but uh, we'll, we'll see. 
Um, before we close out, I do want to touch on what we talked about last week for our, our loyal listeners. Uh, everyone's aware of where the safe landed. We were very optimistic, like I think all of us in the industry were. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have much to say other than I, I still, I think I'm, I'm a an optimist uh, in general, and I think it's better to be an optimist. But it, these types of things, when they don't work out certainly like hurt more, you know, than being the cynic or the pessimist, you know, where you're like, well, I wasn't expecting anything in the first place, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, I think that, uh, we've talked about it at nauseum about, you know, the people that this would impact. I think there's, you know, all sorts of angles that you can look at this thing from, uh, from, you know, companies getting funded from, you know, more interest in the category outside of, you know, the people that are looking at it like us all the time. Um, and then, you know, just people that literally need banking that struggle to get banking. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's disappointing. Um, I guess the silver lining is that we're operating in the world that we've always been operating in and nothing changes in, in that capacity. And, and we've been operating like this for a long time. Um, so we should be pretty good at it. Um, that's all. I mean, I could say I, it's just disappointing. Um, I don't know. What happens if it doesn't happen in lame duck? I really don't. I think everyone has different opinions, but uh, probably not not great for the legislation. Well, it's very clear since the action after it didn't get included. It when once it became clear it wasn't going to be in the NDIA, the markets have clearly let us know what they think about it, which is that they're very pessimistic that anything positive happens here and what it actually means for the potential of the industry. So that's being priced in. I think we, you know, it's, it's December 12th. We hit kind of like low lows on these stocks and which is too bad because they're demonstrating that they're solid companies in general. Um, but so, you know, it created a sucking wind of a vacuum on, on the capital interest in it. But, um, and it's funny, you know, um, I think, you know, we've talked about it a bit on the pod that Morgan and I got into this, um, kind of stemmed out of a family thing. And uh, today would have been my dad's birthday. And I was thinking as we were kind of looking like this might happen, I was like, well, that would be kind of cool if it happened around his birthday, you know, because he was substantially a fan of cannabis. And that would have felt like a nice little, um, I don't know, just like a moment of like, yeah, we're doing this and, and it's all working. But I think Morgan and I, you know, we reflected, we, we started this year with a very low perspective outlook that this would happen you know, you get your hopes up. We're entrepreneurs. I think we all have a open aperture and a, and a hopeful perspective, but then just recalibrating where we are. I've been talking a lot about the rescheduling thing that's coming. And then really the benefit of being a private investor is just being able to focus on the companies and building businesses. And that's what we'll just keep doing. And I think that's what we'll keep doing on this podcast. You know, safe probably won't happen in 2022, or maybe it will. We don't know. But I think I'm letting go of an outcome on that and just continuing to focus on building businesses, which which is what we can control. And I think on the podcast here, what we'll continue to do is continue to cover data trends. We'll continue to cover what is happening in this market as we watch more states open and more consumers gain access to the product category and evolutions in what's happening around consumer preferences, including generational preferences and and where cannabis finds its place in, in, at the table for us, so to speak, as a uh, part of our lifestyle. So we'll keep going. Yeah, well said. Um, certainly, I think uh, next year for lack of safe banking will be interesting, but again, it's the same that it's been. Um, and we have new markets coming online. We're finally going to see what New York looks like. Uh, <laughs> I guarantee you'll have a lot to say about it one way or another, but it will be an interesting show to watch. Um, and then Missouri uh, also opening up for adult use. Uh, Connecticut, I think. Uh yeah, as well. So there's a lot of progress and uh, a lot of operators, a lot of brands, you know, a lot of retailers um, that are out there doing, um, you know, what they're doing, like building this industry up. Right. And that's yeah. not going to change. It, maybe it would have been a little easier for them in some ways, uh, but they're still going to do what, what they're going to do. Uh, and we're going to, you know, watch it and, and support it and talk about it here on the podcast. So yeah, disappointing. Uh, but, uh, you know, here we are and who knows, maybe we'll be surprised, but, uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't count on it. Yeah. Maybe if, maybe if something happens, we'll do a spaces. That'd be awesome. Yeah. We'll um, see. well, 
I want to close with uh, this week. Uh, we're going to be doing a cool event with Trailblazers. So Trailblazers is a, um, what would you, an industry organization that brings people together. They host a lot of events. Yeah. A lot of industry people come out to those events. They have, a, it, it's, it's not like a, an event in the traditional sense. It's more of kind of like a getaway. Uh, they have some programming, but it's a lot of just networking and connecting. Um, and it, it's a great group. We're a part of it. And uh, they reached out. They wanted to do something to kind of talk about the the year in cannabis and, uh, you know, what we're seeing at Headset. So uh, I'll be presenting and then Emily, Emily and I will be doing a discussion just on, you know, the trends in the year, what to expect next year. And it's kind of going to be like this. So uh, we encourage everyone to come on out, come and listen to that. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, that is happening on Wednesday, the 14th. Uh, so uh, if you're listening to this on Tuesday, the 13th, uh, that's just tomorrow uh, between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Pacific. So mark your calendars and we hope to see you all there. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.